Welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church of Atlanta. And we are live and we are glad that you are joining us. We have a few people in the sanctuary, but maintaining safe precautions. We also, uh, the session decided that we will continue to worship with just essential personnel here in the sanctuary until January. Uh, we will reassess at that time. So we hope you will join us live every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. If you are not one of our congregation and do not receive our e-blast with the uh, bulletin that you can print, please contact our office even through the Facebook page and we can put you on the email list. I have one pastoral announcement before we start worship. Uh, Mickey Hubbard's sister, Robin, passed away this weekend after being in hospice care for a short while. Please keep Mickey, uh, keep her son Aaron, and especially her parents, uh, her mother Sandy and her stepfather Bill, in your prayers. Uh, they were all together at Robin's side. So we keep her in our prayers, and we pray for God's resurrection and the hope that, that we all have. So now let us prepare ourselves for worship. Heaven is declaring God's glory. The sky proclaims the handiwork of God. They don't speak a word. We may not hear a voice. But the message reaches all the earth, traveling around the world. short of the glory of God, therefore let us come before God with confession. God of sea and sky, of flower and field, we have lost sight of the goodness of creation. We are no longer aware of the rhythms of the earth, of what foods are in season, and when the stars move in their courses. Remind us that you created us along with the living creatures of the earth and the sea and that we are part of creation you spoke into being. Forgive our distance and our ignorance and help us to walk gently upon the earth. Hear us now as we lift up our silent prayers of confession. misguided deeds confuse us or overwhelm us and draw us away from God. 
God continues to draw us near to forgive us with assurance. So hear these words of good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And be at peace because God does restore us and strengthens us and waters our gardens, those parched places in our soul. Therefore, pass the peace that passes all understanding to one another. The peace of Christ be with you all. first reading is Psalm 65, verses 5 to 13. By awesome deeds you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation. You are the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. By your strength you establish the mountains. You are girded with might. You silence the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. Those who live at Earth's farthest bounds are awed by your signs. You make the gateways of the morning and the evening shout for joy. You visit the Earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide the people with grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges softening it with showers and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with richness. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. Our second reading comes from the 38th chapter of Job. This comes after all of the horrific things that happen in Job's life and after his lengthy debates with his best friends about why some of those things might have happened. The Lord answered Job from inside the whirlwind. Where were you when I laid the earth's foundations? Tell me if you know. Who set its measurements? Surely you know. Who stretched a measuring tape on it? On what were its footings sunk? Who laid its cornerstone? While the morning stars sang in unison and all the divine beings shouted, who enclosed the sea behind doors when it burst forth from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and the dense clouds its wrap, when I imposed my limit for it and put a bar and doors and said, you have come this far, 
but no farther. Here your proud waves stop. Have you gone to the sea's sources, walked in the chambers of the deep? Have the death's gates been revealed to you? Can you see the gates of deep darkness? Have you surveyed the earth's expanses? Tell me if you know everything about it. Where's the road to the place where light dwells, darkness? Where is it located? Can you take it to its territory? Do you know the paths to its house? You know, for you were born then. You have lived such a long time. Have you gone to Snow's storehouses and seen the storehouses of hail that I have reserved for a time of distress, for a day of battle and war? What's the way to the place where the light is divided up and the east winds scattered over the earth? Who cut a channel for the downpours and a way for the blasts of thunder to bring water to an uninhabited land, a desert with no human to saturate dry wasteland and make grass sprout? Has the rain a father who brought forth drops of dew? From whose belly does ice come and who gave birth to heaven's frost? Water hardens like stone, the surface of the deep thickens. Can you bind the Pleiades' chains or loosen the reins of Orion? Can you guide the stars at their proper times and lead the bear with her cubs? Do you know heaven's laws, or can you impose its rule on the earth? Can you issue order to the clouds so their abundant waters cover you? Can you send lightning so that it goes and then says to you, I'm here? Who put wisdom in the remote places, or who gave understanding to a rooster? Who's wise enough to count the clouds? Who can tilt the heaven's waters containers so that dust becomes mud and clods of dirt adhere? For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. When I was a kid, each summer we would take what my parents lovingly referred to as the annual guilt trip, driving north to see both sets of grandparents. We'd get up early in the morning to make the drive to Pittsburgh in one day, arriving at my grandparents' house late at night. At least it felt late. It was certainly after bedtime. The next morning, my brother and I would head to the kitchen for breakfast, and before too long, we'd be outside in the cool of the summer morning. A rare treat after our summers here in Atlanta. We'd move to the the picnic bench that sat on the back driveway so that we could get a jump start on climbing the sycamore trees in the backyard and run and chase each other in the nearly acre lot. In the evenings, we'd spend time on the big porch on the side of the house, and while the grown-ups talked, my brother and I would play in the front yard. One of my favorite things to do was take off my shoes and walk in the grass of that yard. I still have no idea what kind of magical grass my grandfather had in that yard. I have never found grass this far south that was anything like it at all. It was cool and soft, and you could feel the ground underneath. Not hard clay, like we're used to here in Atlanta, but soft, dark earth. I remember feeling the roots of the maple tree in the front yard that eventually was big enough for us to climb. It's the smelling of the green manicured shrubbery. Now that grandmother was not a gardener. She had a well-kept house and a well-kept tidy lawn. And after a few days there, we load back into the station wagon and head even farther north to a small town outside of Syracuse to the other grandparents' house. This grandmother was a gardener. There was usually a vegetable garden in the back, but her pride and joy were the flowers around the house, all the way around their little postage stamp house, 
It was a very narrow border, probably not much more than 12 or 18 inches wide, that she filled with flowers. She taught me about forget-me-nots and Johnny Jump Ups and all sorts of other flowers. She had quite a green thumb, even at the end of her life when she lived in a small apartment here in Atlanta. A few years ago, I had the chance to return to that part of New York with my parents for a family reunion. And the thing that struck me when I got out of the car was the smell of summer up north. Green and growing things. The scent is such a powerful trigger for memory that I was immediately back in those childhood summer backyards in my bare feet in the cool grass. I feel like it's been a long time since I've walked in cool grass in my bare feet. Sure, there's been a moment here or there, but for the most part, in my own yard, I wear shoes. I also have had yellow jackets, so that may be why. The other thing I love, though, is to walk in my bare feet on the sand. Even when I get, don't get to do long walks on the beach, which I love, just having my toes in the sand makes me happy. As we continue this walk through Barbara Brown Taylor's book, An Altar in the World, this week we're looking at groundedness. She calls it the practice of walking on the earth. One of the things she points out early on is that for most people, walking is a really easy, accessible spiritual practice. It doesn't require a spiritual director or any outside expensive tools, like a treadmill, you simply have to be willing to get outside and do it. You never know what you might encounter if you slow down enough and pay attention. Birds you never knew inhabited your neighborhood, or the lovely garden on the next block, and the woman who painstakingly tends it, the different kinds of trees, the rhythms of life. And the memories of seasons gone by when life was slower or maybe just felt a little different. These are the feelings and the memories, I think, that drove the psalmist in our text. A deep connection to the earth and a joy in God's good creation. There's a celebration of the grandeur of creation and a sense of gratitude for the gifts of the divine. One commentator called it an animated richness of nature provided by the divine presence. Now, Psalm 65 was written likely as a part of celebrations for the harvest, which make it a reminder that our forebears lived closer to the land. The tie to the land was essential to their livelihoods, and it was viewed as an indicator of how they were living out their commitments to be faithful followers. In the psalm, we see nature brought to the fore with joyful exuberance, and the sharp edges softened, and the presence of God is shown as powerful, gracious, life-giving. But at its core, it's a song of praise and thanksgiving, not simply for the abundance and bounty of the earth, but the full measure of what that means. It also means deliverance, salvation, redemption. In her book, Creation and the Cross, Elizabeth Johnson explores the question of our salvation and that of the planet. She makes the case that God has a relationship with all parts of creation, not just humanity that we are part of the community of creation, of the web of life, and we have lost sight of that. The psalm reminds us of a world alive with the bounty and glory of God. Johnson reminds us that human and animal bodies are created from the same dust and share the same breath, that God is the hope of all the ends of the earth. But we forget. But that's not new, because Job forgot too. Now before we get to this point in Job's story, 
Every imaginable hardship has battered him. And he and his closest friends have debated what he might have done to deserve such punishment. And his friends definitely see it as punishment. And Job has wished he was never born. Now, his wish doesn't turn out much like George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life. Rather than the benevolent Clarence the angel, God addresses Job's complaints directly, arriving in the midst of a whirlwind, a cyclone, a great storm with a rushing wind. And God reminds Job of a very important lesson. It's not all about you. Humanity, while important, is not the center of the universe. God takes Job on a whole new world style tour of the cosmos and asks Job and his friends a simple question. Where were you when I created the earth? God asks Job about their part in creation, reminding them and us that our job is to live in harmony with creation, not to feel like we created it. As the speech continues, a picture of a world that is wild and beautiful and free emerges. We catch glimpses of creatures that are almost beyond imagining, like the behemoth and the Leviathan, which we don't see and certainly don't control. In these peace speeches, God puts Job and us in our place as a part of creation, not the center of it. Throughout their arguments, Job and his friends have written themselves into the center of the universe. Even so, in the midst of life in chaos, Job stands up and demands answers from God. But he doesn't quite get the answer he expected. God's answers to Job breaks open the world and expands it, showing him places and creatures he never could have imagined. After conversations going round and round about reward and retribution, God then shows this expansive world of freedom and grace, a world where human salvation is inexorably linked to that of the whole of creation. I suspect many of you are familiar with the concept of a labyrinth, not the maze where you get stuck in the corn in the fall, that has dead ends, but a singular path that leads to a center and then back out again. As a meditative tool, its goal is to help the walker discover an inner sacred space, a reconnecting to our center, to the still, small voice that speaks to us across time and space, the smallest hint of the whirlwind that Job encountered. But a labyrinth is a microcosm. It is both inner sacred space and a metaphor for a larger cosmic reality that we are part of a greater whole. Taylor points to the labyrinth as a tool for both spiritual practice and a way of connecting to the earth. Well, there are many labyrinths found inside church buildings, the most famous being in Chartres in France. Many are built out of rock or stone or are carved right into the land. In a labyrinth, the journey is the point. You are there to walk. There's no one way to walk a labyrinth, but the hope is that it allows the walker, the journeyer, to catch a glimpse of that cosmos within and of the great expanse of creation that God shares with Job. We make the way by walking, which means not moving at the speed of our cars or the internet. Hello, internet. But by taking the time to notice the earth under our feet, preferably without shoes, to be reminded that we are a part of this creation we survey, not just plopped here to tend it, 
but to join together with the whole of creation to proclaim the good news. We may not get the experience of Job and his whirlwind tour, but God is still asking us not to put ourselves at the center. Where were you when I formed the ancient atoms? And where were you when I filled the seas and oceans? And where were you when I set the stars in place? We make the way by walking, both as part of a community of faith as well as in our own lives. But we can't do it without walking. If we rest on our laurels, we're no better than Job's friends who continually try to find out his transgressions. Instead, we need to be a little more like Job, even when it means railing at God, especially when it means railing at God. Because in some way, God will find a way to remind us of the order and enormity of the whole universe of creation. And we must remember to practice walking gently on the earth so that our vision expands, which fulfills our hope, remembering that God's concern is for all of life and all of creation. Amen. Let us join together in prayer. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on us. As the afternoon showers quench the parched earth, so you quench and revive our souls. 
So remind us each day to go outside, to walk barefoot in the soft grass, to rise and notice the morning sunrise, or to watch the evening sunset, to listen to the birds chirping, to hear the cicadas singing. Remind us, O oh Lord, that we are part of your wonderful creation and draw us to you, even though we may feel overwhelmed by the fears of contagion or the despair of so many suffering. Remind us that you are with us, have created us, and have kept that balance alive for eons. You are the one who answers prayers. So hear our cries to you as well. We cry for the children who are malnourished and starving and not receiving the plenty of the harvest that you have offered this world. We pray for their parents who are literally not allowed to work and for those parents who are essential workers and possibly carrying a potential threat into their own homes. We pray for parents struggling to keep home a peaceful place as they seek to work to guide their children and to run the household with little time to catch their breath. We pray for schools to be wise in how they will teach, for the safety of teachers, administrators, and school workers, and those making the decisions. May they be guided by your wisdom to honor all persons, young and old. We do pray for the children that they will find motivation to learn and to cope when separated from their friends and teachers, give, uh, give attention and aid to the kids with special needs and learning disabilities, and to the families who are too, too poor to have internet service and laptops, may no child be left behind. We pray for the unemployed whose pay relief has dried up, show compassion toward them from the community that surrounds them. For our lawmakers and petitions in our city and state and nation, for our president, guide them all to see your concern for the least of these, to feel the angst of benefits being cut, and to steward the wealth and means of our nation to provide for all who suffer in our midst, and to reach out to those starving and ravaged in other nations without the means to cope. And with all our attention turned on the viral threat and the economic peril and the political bantering, let us not forsake the earth and the balance of life that you protect and preserve. Make us conscious of our participation and interdependence with all creation. And may we love our non-human world as our neighbors as well. Lord, we do lift up uh, Mickey Hubbard and her family this morning for her parents, for Sandy and her stepfather Bill, and for her son Aaron, for their grief in losing Robin, uh, for the peace that you offer to Robin, the assurance that you offer all of us. We give great thanks to you. And now with all these prayers and cries to you, hear us as we continue to pray as Jesus taught us, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Normally, I would tell you from, to go from this place, but today I'm going to tell you to stay in your place. But walk around. Feel the earth <coughs> under your feet. Tend your plants and your pets and your loved ones and yourself and know that God is present with you and that God knows that we are a part of the web of creation that we live together and we die together and that we live in God. So that may the love of God, the fellowship of the community, and the peace of Christ be with you all. Amen.